Welcome, people. Uh, this is uh, Jack Horak uh, from Tango, uh, and I am here delivering to you my monthly Tango Trends column via Zoom video uh, for February uh, 2021 with uh, two Tango partners, uh, Ben Kelly and Ed Spinella. And before I get into the topic, which, which is going to be very interesting, I think, why don't I ask each of them to do a quick introduction? Ed, do you want to go first, please? Sure. So I'm Ed Spinella. I'm, I'm actually in our, our Hartford offices today for the law offices of Mirtha Kalina. Uh, we're a proud Tango partner. I uh, had the privilege of being mentored by Jack um, when he was still practicing law. And I've uh, just been amazed of how much the organization has grown. We represent all kinds of different types of tax exempt organizations of all different shapes and sizes. Essentially, we're, we're a, full, a full service firm, but have a proud freestanding robust uh, practice group that represents all kinds of different nonprofits. Great, and, great, uh, great. Good happy to be here. Good, good. Hey, ben? 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 Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you, Jack. Thank you for thank putting you this for together. You. My name is Ben Kelly, founder of Private Capital Group, a wealth management firm in West Hartford, Connecticut. And we're proud to service the nonprofit organizations and their endowment and foundation asset management. We recognize the value that these nonprofits bring to the community. And it's a privilege to serve these organizations on the investment management side and uh, look forward to this engagement today. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Yeah. And, and the engagement today has everything to do with money and, mm -hmm. and more specifically endowment money, money that a nonprofit may hold in a true endowment, which we'll talk about. Right. Um, and Deal, and we're going to look at endowment and spending from endowment and investing in endowments in the context or the confluence of two kind of weird events, out of the ordinary events. One is COVID and the impact that COVID had on fin finances of organizations in the milieu of the last year with PPE loans and everything else, combined with the fact that the stock market is, is at highs that were undreamed of just two or three years ago. Now, whether or not this is a bubble or not, that's a, that's a topic for a different day. But at a time when you have an endowment that looks rich, richer, and you have financial needs that are unusual, to what extent should you or shouldn't you look differently at the monies you take out of your endowment in the middle of all this. So with that said, let's turn this to Ben to talk about the basics, you know, investment policy, spending policies and how it works and how he advises his clients. Then I want to turn to Ed with some on the spot legal questions, uh, which inevitably arise in this context. So Ben, why don't you start us off? Yeah, thank you, Jack. I mean, the basics are always important, no matter what size of the organization and the reality is these endowment funds are governed by a law called a MIFA or Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act. And it sets the foundation for good governance. And everybody who is involved with these assets under management has a fiduciary responsibility. And so the single most important document that an organization can have is an investment policy statement. And it, it could be as easy as one page or 12 pages but if you don't have one, you should have one. And the most basic parts of an investment policy statement typically start out with the mission and purpose of how are these assets aligned to achieve the mission and purpose of the organization. Okay. Uh, the second thing is the roles and responsibilities. That starts with the board, the investment committee, the investment consultant, the investment managers. And this single part of the document would hold each one of those committees or representatives accountable. Uh, the third part of a good investment policy statement would involve the investment objectives. And okay. to the extent that uh, you understand risk and reward, you know, it, it dovetails to just the pure basics of asset allocation. How much do you have in cash bonds and stocks? It gets much more involved than that, but those are the pure basics and trying to achieve those long-term objectives also has some accountability as performance assessment. So, you know, underlying those investment objectives, that's where you can make a real difference. And these organizations generally are in perpetuity. So you want to have a good long-term strategy and a performance measurement. 
And then lastly, in a good investment policy statement, you're gonna to wanna to have an annual review. Um, frequently there's fine tuning in an annual review, or it's just documenting the fact that your existing investment policy statement is as good it was, as it was a year ago. So a good investment policy statement, um, again, starts out with mission and purpose, goes through roles and responsibilities, investment objectives, and an annual review, and uh, tends to be the smaller organizations have a shorter one, bigger organizations have a more detailed one for all of these attributes to, to make sure the organization is upholding the up, up NEPA laws. Yeah. Before, before, before turning to the spending side, spending policy, which is deals with how do you take money out of that, that endowment fund managed in accordance with the, the investment policy you just described. Um, I think people ought to know, and, and Ed, this is for you, uh, right. that all of those things that uh, Ben just described using the word fiduciary are legal requirements, right? I mean, they're, they're statutory. Right. They're just, you know, just so people understand this is not something right. we're making up. I mean, it, it's rock solid right. law. It's very, it's very solid law, Jack. And, and in many ways, let's go back to the basics. You know, as fiduciaries, there are um, really a couple places that are really key for you to have a working knowledge of. One is up MIFA, which is the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, um, mouthful, but a really important statute. And it goes into issues such as your fiduciary responsibilities as they apply to investment strategy, as well as appropriation or expenditure of, of the quote unquote endowment fund. Um, yeah, that, that's the spending policy side, correct. which we'll come right back to. But right the now. management is absolutely key too. And you know, people always say, well, what does that mean? Is it the perfect person standpoint? And how do we meet our fiduciary responsibilities? Well, the statute has some parameters built into it, you know, but also I think what is really important is to think even more to the basics the Connecticut Revised Non-Stock Corporation Act, because most, most of our clients are Connecticut non-stock corporations. The duty of care, so crucial to understand right. what does it mean? And a, and a big part of the duty of care is, yeah, act like a reasonable person in the best interest of your organization, but don't be afraid to look outside of the organization for qualified outside advice, whether it's Ben or a lawyer or the CPA all those different instances where you're not expected to be the perfect person. You should and are expected right. to, I would say, to look outside the organization. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's well said. So I think if what we've heard from Ben and Ed so far is the lineup on the, right. the investment side, you know, we're not talking about donors or donor development, where we're talking about the money's already in the door subject to a donor restriction. Right. Let, let's then turn to the standards, uh, both been in terms of how you would draft a spending or advise someone to develop a spending policy and why, and again, some of the legalities of that, Ed. Mm -hmm. And then I want to come back around to a, like a more pointed question, you know, uh, uh, on basically uh, on the on the COVID expense inflated market uh, question. But Ed, Ben, please, uh, does the, the uh, spending policy side of this? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jack, and you know. COVID uh, has presented uh, a pleasant surprise in the stock market, but we'll get to the financial crisis of 12 years right. ago when we fell off that. But really when it comes to the spending policy, right? You're, you're looking at the health of the organization, its operations and goals to fund its initiatives in the community, but there are up NEFA laws and there are things that you can't exceed. You certainly wouldn't wanna invade the portfolio for greater yeah, than- Why don't you explain what the rationale for that is, Ben, in terms of you know keeping pace with inflation and stuff so people yeah, understand I mean, it? Sure, I mean, to the extent that you're looking at an organization that wants these assets to support the organization 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, you certainly don't want to invade the principal and have a less of a asset base to support the organization 10 years from now. So there's often a battle between what the organization wants to support operationally and draw on the portfolio, which might jeopardize the organization 10 years from now. So there has to be a very structured spending policy. And the reality is the stock market does not just have an even rate of return, it goes up and down. So the portfolio may lose money in one year, gain money in another year. So you know, one of the thoughts is just take 4% of the trailing one year performance. But then when the markets weigh down, the operations suffer budget-wise. Right. So there are different spending policies. Um, 
And the, the, there is a there is a standard in up MIFA that talks exactly to this issue, as well as the management and the investment. As, as well, why don't you, what, Ed? Why don't you pick up on that one though? The first yeah, thing. I mean, I, I don't want specifically about what Ben's saying about the yeah. spending. Yeah, no, he's he's spot on. I mean, when when it talk, I think one of the things to keep in mind, and th this is a tough one, and it's a tough one on a Friday morning to get our, our minds wrapped around, but there is something very almost metaphysical. That, that is going on here. And that is that an organization, a legal entity, its purposes can survive that organization's existence. In other words, you know, just, just within the last year, I had a wonderful client that I've had the pleasure of working with for almost eight years now. They got to a point where they made, in my opinion, a very um, selfless and responsible decision to wind down and liquidate, not because they were out of money, but because they said, you know what, if we really want our mission to survive, we could do one of two things. We could pray and hope for a change in, in our grant structure and, and economic conditions, or we could responsibly want and liquidate, transfer our net assets, our endowment, our other donor restricted funds to other organizations who can, who can continue to use those funds for the reasons that the donors. That, that, that's really important, Eddie, and, and, and because yeah. it ties in directly to what Ben said about you know, the mission being 20, 30, 40, 50 in Absolutely. perpetuity, theor theoretically. Yep. And so, when you're managing money now, you have to have the, the needs of the future, right. the clients, the mission's needs in 30, 40 years. And, and that's, mean, that's, a, that's a really prudent decision. Yeah. To say. Like we can't cover it operationally, but rather than let's spend it all down to zero covering the light bills, we're going to give it to another organization yep. organization so the mission will live. And yep. that's, that's why you do what you yep. said. You know, and that's baked right into the UPMIFA. It says right in there, the needs of, uh, it says one of the factors that you should be considering shall be considered in managing investing and then also spending um, is later on is the needs of the institution and the fund to make distributions and preserve capital. It's this yeah. idea that those needs are going to be there forever, you know, um, and, and you need to balance the immediate needs of the organization with the long-term needs of the charitable cause that, that you're organized to support. Yeah, let, let me do this, guys, because I want to, you know, kind of stick to a, a reasonable time limit here. L let's bring it down to with the rubber hitting the road. Where, w what are you guys seeing out there? I mean, I mean, I I'm not in practice anymore, so I'm not really in touch with clients on a regular, daily, weekly, monthly basis in terms of what the crash crunch is like. But 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 but, but I mean the. It, the COVID expenses versus the amount covered by the government, inflated market, high market values. Are you see? Is there tension emerging? Are people saying, you know, can we, uh, can we dip, violate our uh, spending policy this year by taking an extra X amount of dollars out because of the black swan event of COVID, which no one could have foreseen. I mean, any noise on that? I, I did, Eddie, you did send me something that yeah. the Attorney General's office in Massachusetts published on that. That yep. That is, I read it this morning and it's, I mean, I think it applies to Connecticut too. It's a good it does, it, it does. And I, and, I, and I, have been, I have been speaking with our friends in the Connecticut Attorney General's office about the same issue. They, they just haven't had the resources and the time to, to, to release such a thing. But what Jack's referring to is the, the Massachusetts AG, and I'd be happy to make this available for people. If they yeah, it's been, April 28th April last 28th. year. 28th, yep. Yeah, Did yeah. a great, a great Q&A, sort of a, a six-pager um, that's really, really well done on. Uh, it's really all about helping organizations facing financial challenges due to the pandemic. And get, it touches on all these big, big topic issues. What I'll say from my own experience and then speaking with other people in this area is that um, the, we're in this uncharted territory, right? On the one hand, you have certain organizations that literally are shut down or they're, or they're sort of shadows of themselves trying to provide virtual services where they can. And yet there's this infusion of government money and then you look at the stock market. So it's, it is this feeling of uncertainty. And a lot of, a lot of the clients that I've worked with have just said, you know, we're taking this a day at a time, but we really are. Every time that we were sort of blinded by the uncertainty or paralyzed by it, right. we're taking a step back and we're balancing those fiduciary responsibilities as best as we can. Yeah, and, so, and some of those smaller ones may not have much right. of an, any endowment, right? Correct. Well, some of them still have right. an endowment of a million dollars, which is not right. a lot of money as things go, but that million right. dollars is subject right. to the exact same rules. But right. I want to close it out with you, with you, Ben, uh, in terms of any um, 
any advice, <laughs> you know, uh, in terms of if, if, if Eddie and I came to, let's say Eddie and I were working with a nonprofit with a $4 million endowment that was kind of in the middle of this. And do you, I mean, any thoughts on what you would say we should do with our $4 million endowment, you know, modest, but enough uh, over the next few years in, in, in light of what's going on? Or do we just stay the course? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's mean, absolutely the right thing to do. Yeah, so I mean, the reality is, uh, you know, COVID has hit, it hits different organizations differently with their grants. Uh, many of these grants have been redirected to healthcare initiatives to address the COVID need. And so some organizations are getting a lot less in grants, some are getting more, mm-hmm. some have received the PPP loan. But to those organizations that are, uh, had a significant reduction in their grant income, they are now looking at an investment portfolio and maybe seeing that it grew by 12% and they had a 4% uh, spend rate and they're looking at this as a source to draw down greater than they would normally. But yet you have this spending policy that was documented that might say, we're gonna take 4% of the trailing uh, 20 quarters, five years. The benefit of sticking to a spending policy is that when the stock market goes way down, you're sticking to a smoothing rate. When it goes way up, you're keeping more of the principal to support the organization 10 and 20 years from now. So from an asset allocation perspective, if we don't get caught up in the market reaching all time highs today, the best thing to do is to have that long-term strategy articulated in the investment policy. And right now, if you had a traditional endowment of 60% in the stock market and 40% in bonds, you would actually be taking some of your profits off of the table, rebalancing back into the portfolio. Mm. And that just sets the precedent when the stock market goes down, you rebalance back into the stock market and you're doing that to support the longevity of the organization. Where it gets trying is when the organization says, look, we have no choice. We need to invade the principle to support the initiatives in our community and then it takes a deeper conversation, upholding the up NEFA regulations. Right. And, and as just a Massachusetts attorney, attorney general thinks says going to court. I mean, you, I mean, you may need to go to court or to yeah. the attorney general's office to get yeah. permission to do that. That that that's the thing is is, you know, is the, sorry, but I don't mean to yes, say please thunder, but it but it's not, and this is very hard for people to wrap their minds around, but but donor restricted assets are one of those things that the law has given an automatic standing to the attorney general's office to have a voice for the public, right? And so, you know, <laughs> bringing them into right. the conversation, they're you not- the You can't just do that willy nilly. Correct. And, and, correct. and I remember when I was in practice and I'll close up with this, right. I remember a couple of times organizations came to me after the fact, after they had already done it, you know? Yeah. And, and, and it, was, it, it was just, a, it was a difficult, situation to deal with in many ways but look guys hey thank you both very much for this you know i do want to point out one thing that uh chapter 10 of tango's book the tango nonprofit method covers all this stuff so it's a good it's a good way to get your mind wrapped around it quickly uh but if you have needs in in the legal area or or the investment area please look up eddie and and ben on our on our web page and give them a call and I'm sure they'd be delighted to uh, take any questions that any of you might have. Absolutely. Hey, Jack Tango's doing a great job and uh, thank yeah, you for this uh, yeah. session today. Tango's, Tango's that little engine that doesn't stop chugging up the hill, right. you know, we're getting there. That's right. That's right. Really nice. Excellent. All right, guys. Stay safe. Right. Thank All you. Right now. Yeah. Right, we'll see you.